So hi everyone and welcome to this video on the different uh, tests uh, to determine if a time series is non-stationarity and the concept of a unit root. So uh, when we say non-stationarity, again, it's an inherent problem that we have in dealing with our time series models and that it may be hard to implement our traditional autoregressive or moving average processes into series that are non-stationary. So while we can always graph to determine if a series is non-stationary or stationary uh, through you know, graphing and visual inspection, well, there's always a great chance of misidentification, especially in the case of a series that may be trend stationary. And central to this concept of non-stationarity is the concept of a unit root, which may be familiar to most of you. So what exactly is a unit root? So to get a better understanding of it, consider this simple AR1 process. So you have yt equal to phi1, yt minus one plus ut. So this is clearly an AR1 process uh, with no intercept. And essentially what would determine the value of the station, uh, whether it's stationary or non-stationary would be what phi is, right? And we said before that if phi is greater than one, right? Uh, I'm sorry, is less than one, then the series is likely stationary. And more specifically, if the absolute value of phi is less than one, then clearly it would be stationary at that uh, level. However, as we note that if the phi is equal to one, then we are left with a random walk process, right? And that process we know by theory is non-stationary. And when phi is greater than one, as in the shocks propagate more so over time, then we end up with a relatively explosive process, which is generally non-stationary. So, but uh, in practice, in economics at the very least, the most common occurrence for a non-stationary uh, series is really when uh, in like a general time series in economics is phi less than one, that's a stationary series, or phi equal to one, that's like a random walk. And in the latter case, of course, the series is non-stationary. So let's now formally define what the unit root is, having seen that sort of stationarity distinction. Now, recall that when we discuss the Wall's decomposition theorem, we uh, underpin this concept of a characteristic equation. And we said that this characteristic equation that we discussed earlier was heavily related to the stationarity condition of an AR process. In particular, we had this sort of equation equated to zero. That's why it's an equation. So it's this polynomial, this characteristic polynomial, this um, uh, left-hand side that you have here is the characteristic polynomial. And uh, uh, we said that it has something to do uh, with the lag order of what we were using. So this characteristic polynomial is equated to zero to get the characteristic equation. And essentially, the characteristic equation is that what uh, the lag structure of it all, the phi, L, how many lags you use, is equated to zero. And as we mentioned by Wolf's decomposition theorem, by this condition, by the stationarity condition, it must be that all the roots that you have that will eventually get up from it, all the characteristic roots of the equation, uh, polynomials, should lie outside the unit circle or should be greater than one. So if one of the two roots is equal to one, then y is said to have a unit root. And that's precisely how we sort of understand what a unit root is, okay? So there are many tests for us to test what, um, what that could be, right? And, uh, uh, or if a series could be non-stationary. And uh, the fall, we will discuss a couple of tests. Uh, three of the tests are what we refer to as unit root tests while the last one is a non-stationarity test. So the Dickey-Fuller test, which is the first test we'll discuss, is a test to determine or to detect the presence of unit roots, right? And the test essentially examines the value of phi that, uh, so if in our model earlier, so we have phi y t minus one plus u t. In, es in essence, <coughs> excuse me, the test is sort of zeroing in on that phi value there. And it's sort of making hypothesis about what phi could be, right? So it tests the null hypothesis that that phi is equal to one. And if we know that that <coughs> phi is equal to one, well, that's a random walk. That would mean that the series is non-stationary, right? 
because if p is equal to one, you know, as we had mentioned in Wolsey composition theorem and our discussions on random walks, that includes um, a non-stationary series. However, if the alternative is chosen, and uh, that's when phi is less than one, then clearly this is a stationary series. Okay, so that's the null and the alternative. Now, how does the test uh, sort of, uh, how is it structured? Well, it employs the use of the difference form of the model. So it typically goes with this one. So we, uh, we discussed the concept of differencing. So delta y t, that's just equal to y t minus uh, t, I'm sorry, y t less y t minus one, right? So in practice, it's how it's done. So you get this difference form here. And we derive this by using, again, the first AR model and its immediate lag. And if you subtract the immediate lag of y t, i.e. y t minus one to both sides of the equation, we are essentially getting this simple difference equation that we have here. So this difference equation can be done and derived quite simply. And in this case, right, we test this uh, coefficient here, which is phi less one, right? And uh, essentially, the test can be extended further to accommodate the inclusion of an intercept or a deterministic time trend, which you may feel should be included if you have some expectation or some knowledge about the series you're trying to test. So you can include this uh, deterministic time trend or an intercept of, uh, before because the, the, the one we had an example didn't have those two, but you may opt to include those two. And uh, as with the base difference equation, the null and alternative hypothesis are formulated in this manner. Again, uh, it being equal to zero, it being not equal to zero. So if you recall that coefficient term, so just the previous slide, that's P minus one, right? So this term here is equal to phi minus one. If, if uh, we follow the null hypothesis that that term is equal to zero, then uh, zero is equal to phi minus one then it must be that phi is equal to one and this imputes something that is non-stationary, right? And if we have our alternative hypothesis that's not equal to zero, then clearly um, it can be a positive or a negative term, right? Uh, say for, uh, and we would sort of understand that uh, that series is likely to be a stationary one. So say that that's non-zero, say it's for example, um, uh, say, 0.5, so say 0.5 is equal to phi minus one. So we get, uh, oh, let, let's make it a 1.5 instead 1.5. So we have a point, sorry, let's make it, sorry, a point, uh, 0.5, I have to transpose that. So I'm just trying to get a simple example here. So uh, if, if we have a series, like say, for example, this is negative 0.5, then if we transpose this, we get a phi equal to 0.5. Okay, so sorry for that. And that imputes that the series is a stationary one. Now you can already sort of see, okay, there are a couple of limitations with this test, right? And uh, one of that is immediately understanding or knowing when to include this time trend or this intercept. Well, it's kind of hard to tell for some of the series whether or not they deserve to have a time trend or uh, an explicit intercept modeled into them. So there should be refinements to the test that we can do to try and, and alleviate that. But there are also other things that we need to bear in mind. So this is just uh, a reiteration of what we did with the red font there. So uh, there was a modification to the Dickey-Fuller test, which we refer to as the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, which I would argue would likely be the most commonly uh, popular, well, the most popular non-stationary to test out there. Uh, which is a unit root test by, by its sheer definition. And uh, this is basically uh, something, a relaxation of the white noise error term assumption. And because in uh, the regular Dickey footer test, we assumed that UT is a white noise error process and uh, it was uncorrelated, uh, there are certain limitations to that. However, as, uh, these, as uh, researchers have noted, if the error term is autocorrelated with its past values, it would need some drift version of the test, which allows for higher order lags, right? And if you run the original Dickey Fuller test in that case, it would result in an oversized test result, suggesting that the true size of the test 
which is the proportion of times a correct null hypothesis is incorrectly rejected, would be higher than if the normal size had been used. And as such, we need to augment the test using some lag order, some number of p lags or autoregressive lags of the original series. And this is what's more commonly used uh, with regards to the Dickey Fuller test. And this is what you refer to as your ADF test, at least the equation you use to test for it. So it's still a difference equation like what we saw before. Uh, we use the difference value yt, but uh, we include a couple of things um, to augment that. We use past autoregressive lags of the difference term, uh, which is this p part here, as well as uh, this uh, time uh, or drift parameter, right? This time trend or drift parameter, and also an intercept. So in essence, it's a more uh, it's an augmented part of the or the original test. Now, uh, I alluded to this earlier, but what are the key limitations of the Dickey-Fuller and the augmented Dickey-Fuller tests? Well, the DF and the ADF tests forces us to choose the optimal number of lags of the dependent variable or the forecast variable in question. And uh, we've shown that in the uh, we have to perform lag selection tests to try and determine the number of lags. But in reality, right, these are just criteria that we follow. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the right lag order to follow. So because we have to choose, you know, arbitrarily a lag order, that's, uh, that's a consequence of um, maybe that impudes or uh, constrains the model from achieving a higher level of generality, I suppose. And we find that the test statistic of these tests are very sensitive to changes in the lag order. So for example, if you were to set the lag order of the ADF to, to say five or six, just so you want the series to be stationary, when clearly it's non-stationary, it could pull you a stationary result just by changing the lag order and being very manipulative about it, which could be very dangerous statistical wise and inference wise. Moreover, the functional form of the model must also be specified. As I mentioned earlier, you, do, you really, uh, do you really need an intercept? Do you really need a drift parameter? Do you really need a time trend? Um, is that, uh, should, should you just not have any of those? So, uh, or would you need a combination of those? So you don't necessarily know at the outset if you would need those, but the test requires you to, to say to it, okay, you need to test this way, right? So the Dickey Fuller and the ADF test have also been found to have low power, right? In, in essence that, uh, its power to be able to reject the null has been relatively low in some circumstances. So for example, if you have a model wherein it's equal to 0.95, it's nearly non-stationary, but not quite, it's still stationary because it's still less than one. By all accounts, it meets our criteria of a stationary process, but what, what may occur is that the result of the ADF test specified or the DF test specified may indicate non-stationarity, especially if the variable that you're using or the, the, the time series under consideration is of a relatively low number of periods or a relatively low sample size. Moreover, these tests have not been readily reliable when dealing with trend stationary processes. So what's a more upscale, a more general version of the test? Well, we have what we refer to as the Phillips-Peron test. And the Phillips-Peron test, like the DF and the ADF, is also a unit root test, right? And the first thing that the PP test, the PP test does differently is that it corrects for any serial correlation and heteroscedasticity in the errors by some modification to the test statistics directly. So the problem of the uh, that the ADF solved, which is if the error term was not white noise was not a white noise error term, it would have a degree of autocorrelation, is automatically fixed by virtue of the modification of the test statistics here in the phillips perron test. Second, there is no need to specify the lag length, which is again one of the main criticisms of the DF and the ADF test. And uh, the way that the test is formulated is using an ARMA process. So you use some linear combination of both moving average terms and, uh, and um, uh, autoregressive terms as a way to model uh, the error term, right? So the equation is similar to the one before, right? So you have an intercept, you, you have an intercept, you have a time trend, and you have this initial term, right? This is y2 minus one. But uh, you also have uh, this error term having the assumption of being ARMA distributed and it being stationary, right? So 
Hence, the error term is not assumed to be white noise. It can take a purely AR process, a purely MA process, or a combination of the two, a more generalized framework than a white noise, which is very restrictive. The last test that we're going to discuss is not a unit root test. It's just simply a non-stationary test. And it's the kwiatkowski philip schmidt shin test, or more commonly known as the KPSS test. And this solves one of the limitations of the ABF and the DF as well, particularly in the trend stationary, uh, in testing the stationarity or non-stationarity of a trend stationary process. So the formulation of the model hinges on the null hypothesis that YT is trend stationary. Again, catered specifically for that. So you have YT is equal to some beta uh, times DT plus an intercept plus the error term. And we do assume here in this case that the error term is a white noise error term. Uh, but the intercept, right, this mu T term here <coughs> can follow this sort of uh, process here where an ET is mu uh, is a uh, is a uh, standard normal right is standard is distributed in a standard normal fashion right and in the model above okay the main modification really is this thing here the dt contains deterministic components and these components may be a constant or a constant plus a time trend right and in the kpss test we test the variance of the error term of this equation which is mu t and the null and alternative hypothesis are specified in this manner so these are, uh, if the null is equal to zero, if the variance is of the error is equal to zero, and if the variance is greater than zero, again, a variance cannot be negative. And if it was found that this is indeed equal to zero, it means that that mu t is just a constant and reduces to a simple trend. And therefore, if that is the case, then you, the series is trend stationary. However, if that variance is positive, then it's, uh, it, means that that mu, that trend, varies over time, suggesting that that YT is not a stationary process. So those are the four non-stationary tests that are most commonly used in univariate forecasting and economics. Uh, and in the next video, we're going to see how these things are applied to the use in our more formal models. So thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.